In the search for Malaysia Airlines Flight 370 that disappeared with 239 on board, what could be a major development? At least two objects, possibly related to the missing plane, have been spotted on satellite imagery off the coast of Australia. One of them, around 78 feet long. An intensive search underway at this moment. Australian and American military search planes diverted, and now Malaysia sending ships and aircraft to the area as well. And while officials are urging caution, they're also describing it as the most productive lead thus far as they try to get photographs of the items to determine whether they are connected to the missing plane. ABC's David Wright is actually on the U.S. Navy aircraft over the area and was able to call in from the cockpit with this exclusive report. Hey, this is David Wright. I am on board a U.S. Navy P-8 Poseidon. Uh, that's uh, a search and rescue vessel. The call sign for this flight is Rescue 74. Uh, we're past a search and area that's uh, headed towards the South Pole from uh, almost due south of Kuala Lumpur. Uh, this, and, and what we're being told by the flight crew here is that they have some intelligence now that uh, there is some sort of debris in the water. They're not clear what. We will be the first plane on site. And uh, we are just descending through the clouds right now. Uh, this plane has some of the highest tech gear available, much of it classified. Uh, and uh, if anybody is likely to find something down there, this plane has a very good opportunity to do so. Uh, it's a serious enough sighting of debris that not only is this plane headed into the area, but two Australian planes are also headed this way. They're going to be combing the waters for the next several hours. We'll be searching for three hours, looking both visually from the plane and also with all the high-tech gear they have on board uh, to see what this might be in the water. It may be a false alarm, but they seem to be treating it as a very promising sign. It's about 1,400 miles uh, from Antarctica. 2,775 miles south-southwest of Kuala Lumpur and about 1,300 miles from Australia. Uh, we've been traveling three hours just to get to this site. We'll have three hours uh, close to the water to search for what, whatever might be down there and then three hours to fly back. This is David Wright aboard a U.S. Navy P-8 Poseidon, a call sign Rescue 74, uh, about 1,300 miles southwest of Australia. Thank you, David. ABC's David Curley has been covering this story from the very beginning. He's here with me at ABC News headquarters in New York. And ABC's aviation consultant, Steve Ganyard, joins us from Tokyo. Gentlemen, thanks very much. All right, so David, what happens now? How do they go about trying to determine for certain if this is connected to the plane? Well, they're going to be taking some pictures if they get over this wreckage that has been spotted from the satellite. Take some pictures. The pictures will give us a much better sense of whether or not this is actually wreckage. One of our experts warns that 78 feet is a pretty big piece for a plane, depending on how it hit the water. Uh, as Steve Gannon would tell you, if it comes down and hits straight into the water, it would really pulverize. So to get a big piece like this, did it skip along the water and then break up? Uh, too early to tell, but these pictures should give us a much better indication, and we would assume that the Australian Australians. In fact, we know that they've already asked a merchant ship to get out into this area and see what they can actually see up close. Yeah, well, Steve, I was going to ask you about that. You know, if this does turn out to be connected to the plane, what do we know more now about? What does it tell us about what happened? Uh, it, it, it tells us that the airplane's finally down and that we're on our way to actually finding out hopefully what happened to this aircraft. There'll be lots of forensics. If, they can, if this is a part of the airplane, if they can pick up pieces of that airplane, they'll be able to do forensics, just sort of like a crash scene investigation. They'll be able to look at whatever parts they pull up. They'll look for signs of fire, signs of impact, uh, anything that might give them clues, and there are lots of ways to do that. So now, really, the, the, the forensics, the, the, uh, the, the really hard work begins in terms of determining what happened to this aircraft. And Steve, you were saying that, that drift and current information is going to be very important now? Yeah, so, so, so part of this, remember that, remember that where this aircraft is is not where it was eight or nine days ago. It's being pushed by currents. These are, these are some pretty wild waters uh, down near Antarctica. So the wind is pushing the, the uh, debris. The currents are pushing the debris. So they need to figure out and do some actually oceanographic forensics and go back and see where the currents are. They need to go back and look at the weather and see where the wind might have pushed it in the past week. But what the Australians have done right now is to drop some buoys into the 
the water that have GPS receivers on them, and these buoys will track the motion of the current that's around the potential wreckage. And they'll send that data back so they can begin to sort of reverse engineer where the impact might have occurred. And, and David, we're talking about water that could be as deep as 14,000 feet. I would assume that that could create challenges of its own. Well, the good news is those pingers from the black boxes work to a depth of 20,000 feet, so you could still get a signal. You need to get kind of over where that wreckage is, which is why tracing back the currents and finding out where it may have actually impacted the water, you can listen for those pingers. And then, yes, you're talking about submersibles to start bringing some of this up. Uh, they certainly would go after the black boxes first. We don't expect to get much out of the voice recorder because it recycles every two hours and we know that the plane uh, apparently was in the air for at least seven and a half hours, so there may not be anything on the voice recorder, but the data recorder, which can have hundreds up to thousands of data points uh, recorded, should tell us everything about this flight and what happened to this aircraft from the moment it left Kuala Lumpur. And, and David, you made the point earlier that this area is actually south of what had been determined to be the search, the specific search area they were looking at. Right, and, and what's important there is that the satellite spotted this outside that search area, so it's an area that they may not have been concentrating on with aircraft, but it also goes back to the currents. I have no idea which way the currents are moving down there, but that gives you a sense. We are 12 plus days into this now uh, that it could have, that could have drifted away from the actual search area, but the good news is that the satellite saw something. Once again, we don't know what it is, but the Australian Australians seem uh, convinced enough to send aircraft and for the Prime Minister to go, to go talk to the Parliament about this, So, uh, and, and, and they're very good allies of us. So uh, the first really good, solid lead we've had in this. And, and Steve, real quick, um, the fact that these satellite pictures were taken four days ago, not a problem, right? No, it's not a problem. Remember, this wreckage is drifting around, so they're looking in broad areas. Uh, it's, it's been a painstaking search, no doubt. Uh, the Australians have done a terrific job, and just hopefully this will be the answers we're looking for, and we can begin to solve this mystery. All right. Uh, Steve and David Curley, thanks very much. Appreciate it. The U.S. Navy aircraft that was sent to the site took off from Perth, Australia, where ABC producer Nikki Batiste is tonight. Nikki. Dan, the anticipation here is high. It was just a few hours ago that the U.S. Navy's high-tech P-8 Poseidon plane took off right here behind me. They've been out searching in the Indian Ocean, looking specifically at some objects that were picked up by satellite. We have heard back from the crew, and they say their radar is detecting objects of significant size. This has given a lot of hope to the people here. We're waiting for them to come back with photographs that will be analyzed before we have any clue whether or not that debris might be the missing Malaysian Airlines flight. Dan. Thanks, Nikki. For the families of the 239 on board, this has been an agonizing 13-day wait for answers. ABC's Bob Woodruff has been following that part of the story from Kuala Lumpur. He brings us the latest from there. Bob. Well, Dan, this is the Cyberview Hotel. There's about 12 family members from, from all from China uh, living in this place. We've seen them outside their rooms, really looking, at, uh, listening to their phone calls. They're watching their emails. They're also getting their news off television. After this news came out this morning, this possibility that they may have seen debris right down in Australia, it's hard to get uh, their feelings because they're not willing to come out and speak to us. Interesting, there's also a medical center that's been set up in this hotel. In fact, the other hotel uh, in here in Kuala Lumpur also has the same, just in case they have some sort of stress so they can rush them off to some other place. Also then up in Beijing, the hotel up there, Lido Hotel, today after that news came out, the police escorted the family members out so they can avoid the media, all the photographers and reporters that were you know, crowding around them. So we're waiting to see how they feel today. Just imagine they, their dream was that this plane would land safely someplace and they would find their loved ones in it. If there is debris in the water, that, of course, Dan, could, could change everything.